While Hong Kong's economy reported an unprecedented boom in a decade, the U.S. has issued an advisory for American firms doing business in the city, warning them of heightened risks. It has also sanctioned seven Chinese officials, and the provocation for all this is Hong Kong's national security law in effect since last summer. Can this advisory actually sway business decisions? How impactful will the sanctions be, if at all? And what's the real picture of Hong Kong's economy? Economy. I'm pleased to be joined from Hong Kong by Whitman Horn, deputy to the 13th National People's Congress, the top legislature, and in the Beijing studio by Professor Liu Baocheng, director of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics. Gentlemen, welcome to the point. Whitman, let me go to you. Now, the U.S. issued the so-called Hong Kong Business Advisory, alleging that U.S. businesses operating there carries reputational, regulatory, financial, and legal risk risks because of the national security law. What goals do you think the U.S. want to achieve through issuing such an advisory? Uh, I think this is, they are running out of other means. So uh, while they are, you know, uh, in the past, we utilizing Hong Kong as a point in destabilizing uh, Hong Kong and China. That seems to become impossible these days under the new NSL as well as a new, um, you know, uh, uh, election uh, doctrine. So, um, and they can't really put a real sanction on top of, you know, without hurting uh, the U.S. economy itself. So now what they're doing is just basically, basically paying lip services. If you, I, actually, I actually took the time to read this whole piece of information, uh, but it, oh no, the statement from the, the State Department. Uh, my conclusion is it's a misleading piece of document based on omitted facts as well as purposely misleading information. So the conclusions are wrong um, and some of the facts are also wrong. Would you so give an example? Would you I give an outstanding example? You say omitted information or wrong information. Give me one example. Uh, one of the things they talk about the Apple Daily, they said that the arrest of Apple Daily is undermining previous assurance of the NSL will not apply re retroactively. Now the court hasn't ruled on that yet. Number one, number two, to most uh, uh, you know uh, uh, open information, it seems that the address is based on crime committed after the NSL have been in place. The NSL have been in place for a year now, right? So this number one. Uh, another thing is. Uh, when the first one, when they talk about the risk of, uh, you know, heightened, uh, heightened risk for businesses, they talk about individuals in Hong Kong have been arrested under the NSL for publishing newspaper articles, participating in routine democratic processes, expressing an opinion regarding the government or the Communist Chinese Communist Party, and attending public gatherings. None of that is true. If you look at all these arrests so far. It's not, they are not under routine democratic processes. It's not because they are publishing one newspaper article, but it's more about their, um, you know, their promoting secession, subversion, terrorist activities, or collusion with a foreign country I see. to endanger national security. Yeah. So, I mean, these are, if you look, that's what I said. It's, it's omitting of facts and also purposely misleading. Let me, let me go to Professor Liu here in the studio. We also noticed the sanctions against seven additional Chinese persons, this time officials, who are deputy directors of the liaison office of the Central People's Government in Hong Kong. What's the point of sanctioning them? Well, it is really uh, there to show a antagonistic sentiment against uh, what is happening in Hong Kong. Uh, so, uh, I totally agree with some schools that uh, uh, they are really running out of ammunition. They start to beat the drum uh, without really uh, knowing or uh, hurting the bird because uh, uh, right now the U.S. is in a very shaky situation. Um, by uh, you know throwing a glass, uh, throwing the the stone into a glass house, that can be also very damaging to the U.S. economy, given the interdependence of uh, trade and investment. So, if you look at you know the Hong Kong, there are uh, you know over uh, 280 uh, U.S. firms, and now they do, they cannot really you know uh, blacklist the. Uh, uh, leaders of global businesses, 
And now they name those, uh, you know, people who are handling the national security. As a matter of fact, these people are there to pave the right type of business environment to uh, safeguard the stability of Hong Kong for uh, not only U.S. but also global businesses operating in Hong Kong. So this turns to be uh, rather a sort of uh, absurdity. In the so-called advisory, the U.S. highlights the uh, growing risks for U.S. individuals and entities operating there after the introduction of the uh, national security law last summer. But a survey conducted in May this year by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong actually shows 60% of American individuals or business in Hong Kong don't plan to leave, and that is 10% higher than the result of a similar survey conducted a year ago. So Whitman, who's not telling the truth? Well, first of all, I think that there is a real risk to U.S. individuals if they are participating in the secession, subversion, terrorist activities, right? <laughs> so if they're not, then I do not see any increased risk. And uh, if you look at what's happening, the MGM survey, it reflects that actually there's a regaining of confidence on the stability of Hong Kong. In fact, if you compare with a year ago, uh, on more than a year ago, when there were still riots on the street, people did face uh, risk, right? Personal risk, okay? Safety risk, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, asset risk. So nowadays, without the riots, with the NSL in place, um, with, you know, everything back to almost back to normal uh, other than the pandemic, you know, people are finding it much safer compared to two years ago. So they, to, to, uh, an ordinary person would think it's a lower risk. In response to the U.S. advisory, the MCN in Hong Kong says in a statement, Hong Kong remains a critical and vibrant facilitator of trade and financial flow between the East and West. And uh, actually in the same statement, MCN announced or d disclosed that it has just purchased a new site in central Hong Kong for networking. Does the statement reflect concern for the kind of risks outlined by the U.S. advisory? Professor Liu? Well, uh it's not only the MCHAN that is really uh, offering the right type of uh, uh, opinion uh, because they are there, uh, you know, they have uh, a large number of uh, companies that are operating in Hong Kong, so therefore they are really telling the true picture instead of, uh, you know, people sitting in the White House or in the Pentagon uh, who are uh, really uh, commenting over their fantasy. Uh, because uh, you do see that some of them have never been to China, has never been to even to the uh, Oriental world. So, uh, you know, businesses, uh, they are really in direct and daily contact with the operating environment, with the uh, legal enforcement, uh, uh, and et cetera. So they are really, really telling the true picture on the ground. So it is really more trustworthy. The other issue is that uh, if you look at the most uh, recent report issued by IMD, is that uh, the global competitiveness of Hong Kong uh, ranking in the world uh, has not really changed substantially, uh, only because of the interruption of the pandemic that there has been certain lowering. But in terms of the, uh, the business environment stability, in terms of the government efficiency, and also in terms of the commitment to uh, to, to uh, uh, judicial justice, and they are still uh, very uh, ranking very high. So, in a in a uh, you know from another perspective, that uh, uh, if the uh, you know foreign companies, particularly the U.S. companies, are encouraged or even are coerced to uh, leave Hong Kong, where should they end up? So, uh, given the U.S., uh, you know, actually they have been kicking those companies away. And uh, now, you know, when uh, many other uh, places are still uh, looming with pandemic, uh, st you know, they are not really comparable to uh, the operating environment in Hong Kong. And particularly now, if you say, okay, you know, the Hong Kong is now under tougher rule of mainland China, but now, you know, mainland, mainland China's business environment remains intact and, and also remains even uh, more attractive to global businesses uh, right. nowadays. So logically, it doesn't make a lot of sense to blame Hong Kong. Of course. 
The former U.S. Consul General in Hong Kong, Kurt Tong, said in a recent article published on uh, Foreign Affairs that Western countries' bark has been worse than their bite, referring to the series of uh, previous moves taken by the U.S. and its allies. For instance, the U.S. put sanctions on Hong Kong before, and it has uh, actually enacted a so-called Hong Kong Autonomy Act in uh, 20, um, 20, twen in 2020, and those moves seem not to have achieved the kind of effects that the U.S. wanted to achieve. Professor Liu, how come the U.S. does not see that, you know, what they have tried are not working and they're going down the same road, it seems? Well, uh, it is very uh, difficult really to force on, you know, what is really the end goal of the U.S. policy towards Hong Kong and towards even mainland China. It's a matter of uh, uh, discontent with what is going on in uh, in China, with uh, uh, what is going on uh, in the regions where China has a sort of influence. And now, you know, Hong Kong is a totally different issue. Actually, Hong Kong is part of China, and it is operating under uh, the commitment of one country to system. But uh, you know, also the Chinese government has the responsibility to. Uh, safeguard the national security and also the you know uh, the social stability in Hong, uh, in Hong Kong. So the uh, mainland China or Beijing is doing the right type of job. So you know the uh, what really can really that allude to is a it's a set of sort of antagonistic uh, you know sentiment expression. So therefore, you really do not see a very clear goal, and also where, uh, uh, and also a very clear roadmap where they are really leading to. It's it's just you know uh, you know shame China, or you know painting a cartoon picture uh, over China so that uh, the uh, Western countries uh, can be misled. So now, actually, in today's uh, a global society, you know, everything uh, that is taking place not only in Hong Kong you know, or even in Xinjiang is re highly transparent to the world and the truth cannot really be shrouded by, you know, uh, uh, you know, by certain cartoon pictures that the U.S. is really painting. Yeah, well, finally, uh, despite everything that it hasn't been able to achieve, it does uh, triggered a very strong response from China. For instance, a statement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says that uh, if the U.S. is bent on continuing such tricks, China will play along every step of the way until the very end. So uh, to wrap up, Whitman, um, was it the U.S.'s goal to upset China and escalate tensions maybe? Where do you see things going? I, I honestly do not know. I mean, there was some, you know, at the beginning of the change of the regime, uh, the administration uh, in the U.S., people were, you know, having wishful thinking that maybe the Biden ex uh, administration will do it differently, and they may be expression of goodwill at the initial stage. But we certainly find out that is not true. Um, the way to confront and contain China seems to become a U.S. state policy, and it continues to be so. Mm. Uh, I think it's going to last for a while. Uh, it's not very pleasant, uh, but it, it's something we have to live with. I mean, I think the, at a certain point, the U.S. And, and, and some of its allies should realize, yeah. I mean, China is not to, doesn't meant to replace or, or, or you know, overrule uh, anybody. But it has its place in the world, right? It and has it its doesn't want to be whole, run global, over by anybody uh, either. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and we have to leave should, it. They should learn that, I yeah. think. Let's see, maybe sooner or later. We hope sooner. Many thanks to my guest, Whitman Horn, deputy to the 13th National People's Congress from Hong Kong, and Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics. You have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we will show you my exclusive interview with Yang Yang, China's uh, star skater and senior official for the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. <music> 